Welcome to the Fortified Life Podcast, where we learn how to develop a dependency on Jesus in the marketplace. From the boardroom to the bathroom, God is with you. Here's our host, author, speaker, teacher, encourager, stewardship coach, and my husband, the man they call Mr. Fortified, Jason Davis. What's going on, everybody? Jason Davis, a.k.a. Mr. Fortify, your Fortified Life podcast host here. We're back for another episode. And here on this platform, we are passionate about building a dependency on Jesus in the marketplace. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got to tell you, our guest today is just so dynamic. I recently met her at a conference, and God is moving in her life. But before I bring her on, let me introduce her to you. Natalie Bourne is the host of Innovation Meets Leadership podcast and the author of Set It on Fire, The Art of Innovation. Prior to founding Innovation Meets Leadership, Natalie held roles as a VP of Innovation and Senior Vice President of Business Development. Natalie has collaborated on two approved U.S. patents and has over 20 years of experience leading product development, UI UX, web development, and strategy and marketing teams. Natalie has worked with organizations such as Career Builder, First Data, IHG, and ADP, leading major initiatives in over 18 countries. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Fortified Life podcast, Natalie Bourne. Hey, Jason. It's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, it's good to have you, Natalie. Uh, now, Natalie, it was really cool meeting you at the Victory Business Summit. And can we just start there for a second? Because you gave a really awesome talk and you were talking about uh, elements of, of innovation and you touched on various number of things, but uh, your participation in that, what made that so cool and, and victory starting not just that event, but really a new ministry. Yeah. Let's just back up and just say the fact that they even started this is so exciting. And I think all of our business people at Victory are just collectively excited for this event. And it was an opportunity really to just dynamically, right? Just merge all these business people into one room. And what I loved about the event, we sold out. Um, we had Horst Schultz come and talk to us about excellence, which he was just phenomenal. And I had the opportunity to also sit down and interview him, which was so much fun. And then I got to really do a breakout where I talked about my book, Set It on Fire, and really just the whole idea of um, launching a business, what you need to think about, how to really derive success and meaning out of that business, and how to ensure that you're really delivering the right results for your customer, right? So it was a super fun day. And, and then we did a panel after that with all of the breakout speakers coming together and just talking a little bit more about their area. So we're excited for the next one. We've already started planning the next one, which will be August of next year, but it was super fun. And, and I really enjoyed just getting to see uh, so many believers and also business leaders so excited about uh, an event like a business summit that was our first ever. So I thought it went really, really well and excited for next year. It was a major milestone, Natalie. As you recount your time there, what were the conversations like? I'm sure people were coming up to you, oh, Natalie, this was awesome. That was great. But what was kind of the pulse that you got? Uh, from that day. Yeah. You know, it's funny because in my breakout, I talk about the, like the five areas, right. That people struggle in, right. What are people's top five fears? You know, the fear of failure, it's the, the fear of change, right. The fear of public speaking. We talked about all these failures and I had so many people come up to me and saying, just looking these failures straight in the face and acknowledging that they exist was, is part of their journey. Right. And the idea that, Hey, Fear is going to be there, but we have to still step out and do it afraid. I think a lot of people were like, Hey, I do want to launch that podcast. I do want to write that book. I do want to launch that business. And it has been these five fears standing in my way of doing that. And I think that's true for almost all of us, right? We, we love our comfort zone because it's comfortable. Um, but if we're really going to be successful, if we're really going to live the life that we're called to live, we have to break out of our comfort zone. We have to break out of the boxes, right? That people have put us in or that we've put ourselves in. We have to crush limiting thinking, which holds us back and tells us we can't be successful. We can't do what we're called to do. And we have to be able to take risk. I mean, that is a big yeah. fear 
that people have is the fear of stepping out of taking a risk. And so a lot of what we talked about in my breakout is how do you take small and calculated risks, not these huge, big risks that could hurt you over time. Absolutely. Uh, Natalie, we know fear is, it's basic on the surface, but then it it, it can be kind of complex depending on what someone has been through, uh, especially when we're talking about God in the marketplace. Why do you think maybe sometimes Christians kind of struggle a little bit more? Like there's this stigma out in the world of, you know, I'm going to go get it. I got to make it happen. And you may even call it blind faith at times, but there's just a little bit more of a, well, I'll just see what happens and we'll go Mm -hmm. with it. Where maybe sometimes in the faith-based community, we're like, "Mm, and I don't know. And let me wait and see. Right. Some of that comes from. Well, I'll be honest with you. And this was one of the things I talked about in my talk. So you'll probably remember this, but the whole idea of having wisdom and a multitude of counselors, usually when someone makes a huge mistake, a huge failure, right? A huge setback, either in their business, something they launched out to do. One of two things is happening. Either they're not talking to the person that they're trying to provide this service for. Mm. So they've kind of created this insular thing where they're just building what they think the market wants, but they're not actually talking to the market and engaging the market. The second thing is, they're not putting themselves in the presence of advisors, people that have been down the road that they'd like to go. And I think it's really, you know, fascinating. We all want to say, Oh, well, I'm cutting a a new road that no one's been down before. Um, and that can almost be a form of pride that prevents us from getting where we need to go. So Mm -hmm. big risk, you know, we should be surrounding ourselves with the right customers who were constantly validating that idea to find out, do they, is that a real idea? Does this have legs in the market? Will anyone buy it? And is it urgent, right? Will they buy it right now? But then on the other side of things, it's this idea of getting counsel. I think that we want to get counsel on the back end after we've already kind of you know, made a mess of things. But oftentimes when we're embarking on a journey, we're embarking on change, getting counsel on the front end and surrounding yourself with the right people is a lot of where I see failures and mistakes happening, especially in the faith community, because we do have an idea, but it's not always about what the idea is. Sometimes it's about when and when is just as important as what. And so having the right idea at the right time and launching it in the right way it matters and it saves us a lot of heartache and a lot of time. If we will get a counselor around us, get someone who's been where we're going and talk to our customers, really put the idea in front of them constantly so that they can validate it along the way. Mm. Folks, she's dropping nuggets already. When is just as important as what? My God, Natalie, you might be preaching. You might be. (laughs) (laughs) Natalie, you were kind of alluding to this, not just in your talk, but even just now, the counsel, the safety in the multitude of counsel, and and just that that confidence. Uh, A lot of times in product development, that ability to... Um, to test, you know, call it the scientific method. Or if you were thinking about, uh, you're probably familiar with Eric Reese's The Lean Startup, like, hey, we have a hypothesis. Right. And then let's go see what happens. And your background, your professional background, you've had experience with that. So kind of take everybody back a little bit because <laughs> you didn't just wake up all of a sudden 2023 and yeah, guys, all you got to do is let's talk about right. just your various stops along the way professionally and how that informs what you do now with your message. Yeah. So, you know, just talking about my background a little bit. So, um, this year I recently launched a book called set it on fire and it is all about my product development background because that's, that's been extensively the place I've spent really the most amount of time. And so I kind of take you on a journey of, of what that's like. And for me, you know, I kind of got thrown into product development. It was one of those things where I went and, uh, down the hall and said, Hey, I don't have a clue if I'd be a good fit for this job, but, but I went in and, and, and I'm excited about what's going on. And, and that really sent me on a journey where, you know, I realized that, you know, and especially when we had the 2008 financial crisis, that crash, um, 
we had this mantra, like we're going to build two new innovative products every year. And that was terrifying because markets were up and down daily and people were being laid off, not only at our organization, but at other organizations. And it was this idea that vision trumps our circumstance. And if visions trumps our circumstance, we have to figure out how are we going to methodically build things that matter in the market and that people care about. And so for me, that started me down this journey of really wanting to spend a lot of time understanding the competitor understanding that competitive intelligence, and then asking myself, if everyone is building over here, where is the market actually going? And how do I have discernment and wisdom and insight for not just what's happening today in this bubble, right? Where all this activity is happening, but how can I point to where the market is going and how can we meet our customers there? And sometimes before they even know they want that product or they want that thing, but how can we meet them along that journey? And so that really, um, is what launched my career, building products, launching products, going from zero to 2 million or zero to 4 million in a year by really getting as close to the customers I could asking them probing questions, um, asking them to look at weird sketches I had made and tell me if they liked it or hated it and really just getting into the world, um, bringing customers together for lunch and having them talk about a feature I was planning to build and leaving that lunch, realizing I don't need to build that feature or leaving another lunch saying, I think I have something. And so oftentimes the wisdom, and at least for me anyway, because I don't feel like I'm, you know, I'm not Einstein, right? I wasn't Mm -hmm. just sitting around coming up with ideas. I was surrounding myself with customers who were having problems and asking, how do I help them solve these problems in a meaningful way? Because if I can help them solve those problems, I have a product. And so that's really my background. That's kind of my upbringing is product development and just listening to problems, listening to frustrations and challenges and saying, I think we can solve that. How can we solve that? Let's figure it out. Mm. And Natalie, you said something, uh, I'm just summarizing, establishing a feedback loop with a customer. So as we get into some practicalities here with people listening to the show, what were some of the ways you did that? Was it literally going out doing interviews? Was it surveys? Was it focus groups? Like, like I think people, they hear that and they go, okay, I need to talk to the customer. And then they go, but what do I do when I go do that? Yeah. I mean, I think it was all of them. I mean, sometimes it's a survey because surveys are super effective and you can get a survey out to, you know, a hundred, 200, a thousand people. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but then part of what I would do in that survey is ask them, for a $25 gift card, can I call you and talk to you for 20 minutes? And that was where I got into conversations. And in those conversations, I would say, Hey, I'm in your area in two weeks. Can I talk to your team? Mm. And so finding those avenues, finding those ways to, to have conversations. So I've done it all. I've done surveys. I've done phone interviews, in-person interviews. I've brought clients to the office. I've gone to their office. I've watched them work in their domain, right? In their every day. I've even watched them use our product in ways that I never intended them to use. And that's where I was most excited to say, well, why are you using our product that way? I never thought anyone would use it like this. And so even in all that, I've done customer listening sessions where take them out to lunch, take them out to dinner. Um, you know, maybe you have five or 10 and you just ask them to discuss even with each other. What are you seeing in your industry? Um, it's a really cool networking thing when you can cross pollinate customers with one another, because if you have a CIO over here and they're meeting a CIO over there, now they can network and they can kind of have some shared best practices. So much about engaging customers doesn't always have to be all about you. It can be finding avenues for them as well, where they can get um, benefit from cross-pollinating with one another. And that's really honestly my favorite thing to do is connect people that don't know each other so that they can get lifelong benefit from, from that connection from one another. So, you know, there's so many different ways to do it. I think part of it is be true to um, the way that you, you best like to show up. Right. And so, if you more enjoy conversation over the phone, do that. If you more enjoy being front of the cut in front of the customer, do that. But, but really us, like you said earlier, Jason, that constant feedback loop is the only way that we kind of aim 
And then we keep re-aiming to make sure we're going to shoot in the right place. Right. Because, you know, and, and any of you have watched like, you know, bow and arrow competitions or anything like that, right. You can be just a little bit off and you can show up miles away from the mark. So, you know, that constant validation, that constant feedback loop enables us to keep going back to our customer and saying, is this really what you want? Uh, or do you say you want it, but you won't pay for it. And if you won't pay for it, then I don't have a viable solution. Mm-hmm. Natalie, as we shift gears a little bit, uh, and we were talking about this earlier, a big part of everything you do, uh, God has given you wisdom to execute uh, in the marketplace. And it's that relationship with God and hearing from God and getting that direction. Uh, So as we talk about maybe a little bit of your personal testimony, um, how would you describe, and this might be sound a little strange for some people, but having intimacy, intimacy with God to make decisions in business, uh, what are you seeing when you spend time one-on-one with the father and, and how that informs what you do? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, so much of our journey is understanding that, especially if you're a believer, if you believe in God, if you follow Jesus, um, we have an unfair advantage as believers because we're so interconnected with the Holy Spirit that if we'll tap into the wisdom that Holy Spirit enables, um, you know, we don't have to go it alone. And so often I will be trying to solve a problem for a customer And I'm like, man, I can't figure this out. But if I get up and I step away and I ask for wisdom, you know, the Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. And just remembering that, you know, we have an arsenal of just wisdom and knowledge available to us that um, others don't have. And I always think about Daniel one. It's like one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Daniel talks about the fact that, you know, he set himself apart for God. And by doing that, God just endowed him with such wisdom and he even had favor, right? So when he would go before the King, he would have so much more favor than everyone else. When it was time to interpret a dream, Daniel had the wisdom to interpret that. And so I just think about the fact that it's a promise in God's word that if you lack wisdom, ask for wisdom. And it takes humility to tell God, you know, or tell anyone, right? I don't know the answer. But when we ask God for that wisdom, and when we rely on him to help us solve a problem, one, we just get an unfair advantage, right? But then we also have the ability to, I believe, go further faster because we're asking for wisdom and discernment and all these different situations that we're in. And, you know, something that I find often is sometimes when people go into business with other people, they just jump right in and they don't ask for wisdom or discernment. And so um, this applies, right? Whether you're creating a product, whether you're trying to figure out who to yoke yourself with, right? Who to go into business with in any of these areas, just really taking a moment to just ask for wisdom and ask for discernment. It's such an important part, I think, of our walk with God. And it's a promise that he affords us for those who are are willing to yield themselves to him in that way. Mm-hmm. So good, Natalie. When you think about your life, Natalie, I'm sure you've had many, but what was a big turning point in your faith for you? Um, if you're not sure if you're a, a Marvel fan or not, uh, <laughs> Natalie, course. but in the Marvel universe, they've got specifically the Spider-Man storyline. They called them canon events. So when mm-hmm. Uncle Ben passed away, that was a canon event yeah. for Spider-Man. What would you say was one of those for you in your faith walk? Yeah. So, you know, I, for the most part, grew up in church. You know, my, my mom was very faithful to get us into church. And it wasn't until um, I was a little bit older that my dad actually started to really come into his faith. And so, you know, when we were younger, we mostly went to church with my mom and occasionally with my dad. And then as my dad started to come to the Lord for himself, then we would all, all go together. So most of my memories, you know, um, are going to church. And honestly, it was just kind of something we did on Sunday. Um, but that, but I did have these pivotal moments in my life, you know, um, middle school was a great example. Like, um, um, you know, I grew up in kind of a rough middle school, at least for me anyway. <laughs> and, um, I just remember I had, I had bullies that would follow me and look for me, ask for me by name. And oh, I just wow. remember like, you know, those moments praying and, and, and asking God to, to show me, get direct me even down which hall to go sometimes because they wow. were looking for me. 
But when I got older in life, you know, probably around 19 years old, that's really where God became real for me. It was more than just someone I called on when I needed help. He became uh, a friend, a savior, someone that I, the best way I can say it is God just became real to me. I think for all of us who've ever grown up in church at first, it's your parents' faith. Yeah. Right. You're following, you're following God because your parents follow God, but there comes a moment where you decide to follow God because he's God and he's real to you and you see him for who he is. And so that for me was my journey. And, um, and I was in college and I just had a, I had a kind of a weird situation happen. I almost got kidnapped. It was a whole, it was a whole oh, situation wow. too long to go into, okay. but God showed me some things in that moment. And he showed me how to get away from this crazy situation. And he just gave me some wisdom that was like really uncommon of how to get out of a really bad situation. And a couple of days later, my friend came to me, knocked on the door and she said, Hey, my mom just called me. This guy was on the news. It was the same guy that had tried to, you know, kidnap me. It was a whole, it was a whole situation at my college. Like, and it was apparently some kind of ring that was going on at the college. And I just remember, and she just like grabbed me and hugged me and was like, I'm so glad you're okay. And I just remember in that moment saying, he's not just someone to call on in trouble. He's mm-hmm. someone who's ever present. He's someone who's always here for you, no matter what you need. And it's constantly giving you wisdom and discernment to, to keep you safe, to protect you, to surround you. Right. That, that scripture of Psalms 91. And, um, that was when I was like, this is no longer my parents' faith. Like I am, I am choosing to follow him. Um, and so, yeah, I truly made the decision at 19. Like I said, I'd always been around God, always grew up around him, but just seeing the way that he was able to speak to me in kind of a a weird, crazy, bad situation. And just seeing how he was able to bring me through to the other side of it was something that I'll never, you know, I'll never forget that moment of being like, God, you're so faithful, even in, even in crazy times. Mm. My goodness. And Natalie, I appreciate your transparency too. I know you said we don't even have time to get into it, but I can only imagine, you know, how traumatic that was and experiencing that, uh, even at 19. So I I definitely appreciate, and I don't take it lightly that you touched on that. You know, there's something, I think there's something to, uh, just meeting people where they're at and topics like that, Natalie, as you know, they're sensitive, but I think sometimes we don't realize that things happen to more people than what we think. And it's like, Oh wow, I'm not the only one that went through that. So, uh, I definitely, it's not lost on me you sharing. Thank you. Yeah. And I hope it, I hope it helps parents too, because I think, you know, at times we, we try to raise our kids to follow God, but sometimes, you know, we don't know if they're really going to make it or not. And I just remember, you know, that what was instilled and instilled in me as a kid, like it, it stayed with me always, even when it didn't seem like it was. And so, you know, I just want to even encourage parents out there that may be listening and having a tough time with your kids. I, I really believe that, you know, that scripture is so true. If you train them up in the way of God, they'll follow God. And it may not be under your time frame, but it'll happen. Mm. Train them up in the way. <laughs> and yeah. now the way maker has made way for you, Natalie, as an author. And so we've got your book. Let's talk about that. We've yeah. been talking all around it. And now let's get into it. I was very excited. I purchased it myself and I'm looking forward to doing a deep, deep dive. But let's talk about it. Set it on fire, the art of innovation. What was uh, the inspiration to write the book and what do you want readers to take away most from it? Yes. So thanks. And, and this has been just kind of a whirlwind, you know, I, um, I've been writing articles and magazines and journals and blogs for years and I never really wanted to be a writer. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I do enjoy sitting down to write, but not in long form, right? Like I, Mm. I, I never really wanted to be an author or write a book. Um, but you know, what, I felt, and the reason why I felt the need to release this content is because, um, I just felt this call that, you know, there is innovation and ingenuity inside each and every person, right? We're created in the image of God. And so if he is the ultimate creator who, you know, the first thing he did was create, then that, that same ingenuity and, and genius is inside of us, um, because we're created in his image. So this is a business book. It's not a Bible study or anything like that. It's a, it's a straight business book, but 
what I felt that I needed to put down on paper was how do you start with just an idea and take it all the way through to go to market, right? So if you have an idea to launch something, how do you get started? You know, most times when I talk to people, that's their biggest struggle. Where do I start? How do I get started? You know, what is step one? So I really walk everyone through different frameworks that I've used in my product development career that can be applied really to anywhere just to say, here's how to get started. Here's the journey. Here's what it looks like. Here's a framework you can use. Um, really cool story. You know, I was having trouble getting an artist to, um, design in the book. And I ended up getting my 13 year old, who's a phenomenal artist to draw by hand, everything that's in the book. And then we just sent it to someone to digitally transform it. Mm. And so all the frameworks have been hand-drawn by her. She's, she's super brilliant, way smarter than I ever was at 13. But, um, you know, so she, she drew all these, all these, um, components. And then I turned all these frameworks into, um, something that people can take deeper in a study guide. And then I also have master class content that goes along with it and frameworks that you can download. And so I really, my, my passion, my heart was to get people to just get outside of the box that they put themselves in and begin to create. Mm. That's really good. So two things, Natalie. One, I always hear that from, it could be speakers and all that. Ah, oh, you know, I didn't really want to, that's not really what I was doing. And then they found themselves. So you had already been writing. That's what's so amazing and, and short form or, or, or mid tier, but mm -hmm. to transition. So it's funny, Natalie, even though you're like, ah, I don't really see myself. And then here we are. I think it's just funny how God, does that. And then secondly, keeping it in the family, <laughs> your daughter, <laughs> uh, drawing that out. I, I think it's really cool when family gets to collaborate on, uh, especially in business. You know, we hear a lot of stories, Natalie, you know, nepotism and things like that. But it, if we think about the crux of a lot of businesses, many are family mm -hmm. businesses. And so for your daughter, I can imagine that's a memory she'll have forever. Like, wow, I drew that from my mom's book. Very, very yeah. cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, so Natalie, as you, uh, as you were writing the book, what would you say was the most difficult chapter to write? Every author that I've spoken to, uh, and even when I wrote my book, it's like you get into this flow and then you hit this one part of the book and you're like, Oh man, I don't know where <laughs> they're not really going to like this. Right. Did, did you have a moment like that or something like that while writing it? You know, I think the hardest part for me was hitting the length that they wanted the business book to be. So like okay. initially I wrote the whole, I would say the whole thing. And then I sent it off to a couple people, a couple customers, and everyone came back and said, it's not long enough. Mm. and you need to double your word count. So I was like, Oh no, you know, cause I'm like, if I can say it in one sentence, why would I say it in five? You know? Yeah. So really just sitting back down with the entire book and saying, um, you know, how do I take some of these concepts and tease them out so people could actually go apply them? And I think the biggest compliment I've gotten about the book is that it's a true field guide. It's not mm. just, you know, um, kind of in the clouds, like theory, it's actually like, and here's how you do it. Yeah. And so that part, I, I really appreciate because that to me came at that second wind of like, I have to write this again, but I would say the hardest chapter to write was probably the last one. Mm. And I think just the stamina of, writing a book is so hard. I was on a, a tight deadline. I had really a God moment happen where, you know, I had a couple different publishers that just randomly reached out. And one of them that I really wanted to reach out, uh, it reached out on their own, which was cool, but then we didn't end up publishing together. And I ended up publishing with another publisher I was looking at. And what was cool about that experience was, um, they had a writer fall out of their June launch and they mm -hmm. said, Hey, if you can get this by April or maybe even, I think it was maybe March, I had to get it in. Um, if you can get the whole book in by March, we can have you be our featured author for June. So um, it kind of went from I'm in the background writing this book until it was like, no, I have deadlines now and I have to deliver by these dates. So, you know, I think part of the, something I say all the time and I say it in the book is like, if you're holding your idea until it's perfect, you've probably missed your moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk to people all the time that have 10 transcripts or, you know, three transcripts that they've written and they haven't released any of this stuff into the world. And so did I go back in my book and find a mistake here or there? Absolutely. But it was better to release the value 
and let people start to get benefit from that value to hold on to something until it's perfect, because then you're just going to edit and edit and edit and kind of edit the brilliance out of it. And so, um, just, you know, again, eating my own dog food, right. Saying, Hey, this is something I teach. Now it's time for me to put that into practice when it comes to releasing a piece of content like this. Mm, Wow. I always loved it. Just get inside the brain of, of authors, Natalie, because there's just so many different experiences that, that people have while writing and in their process. Well, Natalie, as we get ready to to end here, and this has been a wonderful conversation, uh, we could talk for three more hours, but we don't have three more hours. Uh, what would you say you're most excited about going into 2024, Natalie? Yeah. You know, um, for me, I, I do a lot of keynote speaking and that is starting, starting to pick up for me, which I'm always excited about. I love just being able to share, um, you know, some, some of the ideas, some of the thoughts that I've gained over the years in business. I just love being able to share those with groups and, and then help them spark new ideas, new, uh, ingenuity and innovation that's inside of them. And so I'm excited about the lineup next year. I have a couple different places that I'm speaking and I probably need to start putting those on my website. So people can follow along with where I'm going. But, um, but that's honestly the place that I just, um, really enjoy and really love is getting to, getting to speak to, um, audience business teams, audiences, and just help them move their self forward. Right. Sometimes we're just waiting for permission for someone to say, you can move. It's okay. You know, go try this idea out. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about that too, Natalie, for next year. So you never know. You, I may pop up. Love <laughs> I may it. Pop up and <laughs> wave, awesome. <laughs> wave to you from the audience. Uh, well, Natalie, uh, as, before we go, there's a lot of ways that uh, listeners can connect with you. You have a lot of content yourself. You have multiple podcasts. You've got the book, um, several master classes. So kind of just give uh, people where can they go to connect with what you're doing, get the book, uh, listen to your podcast. Uh, where can they find all of that? Yeah. So, um, easiest way is you can follow me on any of the platforms at innovation meets leadership on Instagram, Facebook, uh, you know, LinkedIn, name it. You can follow, you can find me at innovation meets leadership, but if you'd like to look into the book more, the masterclass, the study guide, you can head over to set it on fire.co that said it on fire.co and you can check it out there. I also just recently released the audiobook on audible, which I'm super mm-hmm. excited about. Uh, I'm an audiobook person, so I knew I had to do that, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so many, many different ways, like you said, to connect in. Love it. Love it. Well, Natalie, we've had just, this has been such an awesome conversation and uh, we'll definitely have to do this again sometime in the future for sure. Awesome. Thank you again for having me. This was, this has been so much fun. Indeed. Well, folks, listen, you've, you've now heard where to find all of our information and you should, you should get a copy of the book. I know that I did audio book, uh, ver- audio version is out. Um, and you know how we leave things on this platform. Uh, remember don't compartmentalize your faith in the marketplace and from the boardroom to the bathroom, God is with you. We'll see you next time on the Fortified Life Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Fortified Life Podcast. You can catch us live on Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time and on demand. Check out fortifiedlifepodcast.com for more details. To learn how to live out your faith in the marketplace, grab a copy of Jason Davis's book, Fortify, being rooted in God's plan for work and business. Available on Amazon. You're listening to Gary Worldwide Podcast.